Okay, do we have everyone? We're all set. So I will go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today for Women's Equality Day. Well, so I can clap with you. Welcome everyone, both those of you here in the public garden near the Swan Boats at, uh, in Boston at this wonderful location. This event, we were here starting in 2011. And yes, we had a little blip during the pandemic, but we are so happy to be here again and happy to see all of you. And those of you joining us on Facebook Live, thank you so much. My name is Freddie Kay, and I'm the founder and president of Suffrage 100 Massachusetts. Briefly, just to tell you a little bit about Suffrage 100 Massachusetts, it's a statewide nonprofit organization that prevents events and activities highlighting the largely unknown national and Massachusetts history or herstory of the women's suffrage and women's rights movement because they are intertwined. And we tell the stories of the remarkable achievement of the suffragists, including the tireless work and essential contributions of women and men of color who were often excluded by white women's suffrage organization and whose role in the suffrage movement has been largely overlooked. I'll just mention that Suffrage 100 MA, I'm so happy to say we are becoming, now that the centennial has passed, we've been at this about 13 years, we are transitioning to become the Massachusetts Women's History Center. Thank you. And that will be virtual at first, and uh, that's coming in the fall, and we will also have as its flagship program the Massachusetts Women's Hall of Fame. So stay tuned, and if you're not signed up for our emails, please sign up online or over here at the table so that we can be sure to send you the announcements of when that's all happening and our next events. And I'll pin one right now in the fall, early fall, probably October, not exactly clear, Mariah Baldwin. We are going to honor her. She was an incredible educator in Cambridge. A school is named after her, and we're going to be unveiling a suffrage marker for Mar Mariah Baldwin in Cambridge. So stay tuned for that. So as we commemorate Women's Equality Day, I think it's important to ask, well, what is Women's Equality Day? Since most of us never heard of it, we weren't brought up with it. It wasn't until 1973, thanks to the leadership of New York Congresswoman Bella Abzug, may she rest in peace, that Congress designated August 26 as Women's Equality Day to recognize that in 1920, on that day, 103 years ago, the 19th Amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution after a 72-year battle dating from 1848 and the Seneca Falls Convention, which was the first time that people gathered as a group and took a vote on women's rights initiatives. And they included, thanks to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the um, Declaration of Sentiments included that women get the right to vote, which was seen as way out there, too much, is it going to be too soon, too fast? Lucretia Mott was nervous, said no, no, no. But Frederick Douglass helped convince the audience at Seneca Falls that the right to vote for women was fundamental. So it was adopted, but it was the only measure not adopted unanimously, and it foretold the huge struggle that would lie ahead. And of course, I want to mention Abigail Adams and the Grimke sisters who called for the vote long before 1848, but 1848 was the first time it was organized. So the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention was followed in 1850 and 1851 with the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester. The difference is Seneca Falls was a little more regional. National conventions in Worcester, which we don't hear about a lot, 
where they increased attendance. It was an incredible event, and Lucy Stone and many others had a lot to do with that. So it took decades of work until 1920, when the 36th state, which is required for ratification at that time, was achieved on August 18 in Tennessee, after months of intense lobbying by the SUFs, the suffragists were the SUFs, and the antis, who were supported by the liquor and train lobbies. And I'll just mention that suffragist describes American suffragists in England. They were also suffragists, but when they were arrested and taken to jail, the newspapers made fun of them, and they called them the suffragettes. And the women, Emily Pankhurst, said, fine, call us the suffragettes, we'll take it. But they were considered the much more radical group. The suffragists were in the United States and less radical. Alice Paul went from the United States to England, became radicalized, came back, but no violence here in the States, all peaceful uh, activities. Uh, and so the American uh, suffragists are generally called suffragists. Sorry, I diverted there. So ratifying the 19th Amendment was finally succeeded in Tennessee. Massachusetts was the eighth state to ratify. I'll spare you that other long story. But in Tennessee, Harry Burns, a young man in his 20s, followed the advice of his mother, who sent him a note on the floor of the legislature, and he voted for the 19th Amendment. I highly recommend the book, The Woman's Hour by Elaine Weiss, and the HBO movie, Iron Jawed Angels. So on August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment was officially added to the U.S. Constitution. It precludes discrimination against women, and it reads, in total, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Period. That's the whole thing. So while the 19th Amendment extended the vote to women, which was an enormous gain for women and enabled millions of American women to vote, we also know that discriminatory and horrific Jim Crow laws of the South prevented African Americans from voting, and Asian, Latinas, and others. It took decades to change the laws so that they could vote as well, including the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and many other laws that were passed to remove legal barriers to voting. And we know that today, unfortunately, barriers to voting are on the increase, and we must be vigilant to protect the right to vote and voting access. I'll take applause on that one, I hope. <laughs> we hope the stories of the past and the barriers many are experiencing today will inspire many people to exercise their right to vote and to continue to be vigilant to protect the right to vote and voting access. So we acknowledge that here in the Boston Public Garden, we are on the indigenous land of the Massachusetts who have stewarded this land for hundreds of generations. Indigenous women were active in the women's suffrage movement in the United States, despite knowing that the adoption of the 19th Amendment would not enable them to vote because of other legal impediments. In 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act granted U.S. citizenship to Native Americans, but each state had to choose uh, who had the right to vote, and it took another 40 years after 1924 before Native Americans across the country had the right to vote. So I am pleased to note that one of our first online exhibits when we open the Massachusetts Women's History Center will be an exhibit about indigenous women in Massachusetts. Thank you. Some important thank yous as we get started here. I want to thank the Mayor's Office of Women's Advancement. Um, where are you? Mayor's Office. There we are. Thank you so much for, um, for hosting with us today. Um, Alexandra Valdez, Emma Staff, and Mariangli Chief. I'm just getting some names people today, <laughs> um, joining us today. And also our bodies ourselves, now known as Obos. Oh Are you kidding? <laughs> Co-founders co from its beginning in the late 1960s and still active on the board today. 
So Judy Norsegian is co-founder and board member who has been here with us in the past for Women's Equality Day, and I was so pleased that she liked our idea for uh, this event to honor OBOS. And uh, the people are listed in the program they're gonna be speaking today because of all the work that they have done over the years. So I wanna thank the amazing Suffrage 100 Massachusetts team. We would not be here today but for the dedication and hard work of the amazing team. Our board is small but mighty, and with us today is Georgina Arietta Rudnick and Rosalind Lowe. There we go. Hi. Thank you. Maureen Hansen, our associate director. There's Maureen. Uh, Michelle Jarolowitz, program coordinator behind Facebook there for us. <laughs> Pat O'Halloran, administrative assistant and Sharice Thompson, social media associate. I want to say hello to Kevin Gildak, who's a new dad and couldn't be with us today. And today's volunteers, Alana Bickford, is with us, <laughs> and Laura Yee, uh, Sarah Rubin, where's Sarah? Thank you, Sarah, who's a former board member. And we have two who couldn't be with us today because of COVID. We miss Ella Bukowski and Eileen Ryan. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. Yay, the League! Patty Comfort, Executive Director, and Lily Switterman, Administrative and Program Associate. And uh, thank you so much for coming for our voter registration table. We hope we get lots of sign-ups. Thank you for coming. Yay. And I know the League of Women Voters of Needham is here. Ms. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming. So I want to thank Axie Breen, our photographer, Flashpoint, uh, Flashpoint of Cambridge, who printed the lovely programs, Ryan Woods, Commissioner, and Paul McCaffrey, Director of Permitting, City of Boston. We need a permit to do this, and we so appreciate that they let us do this every year. It's a bit of an exception, I think, that they let us do it, and we so appreciate it. <laughs> um, so um, I do want to mention Lynn Padgett, I think, is going to join us, but she may not be here yet. And when she does, I'll introduce her. I want to thank Governor Maura Healy, Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. Applause for all our leaders. And, and a special thank you and shout out to Boston City Council President and dear friend of mine for many years, Ed Flynn. Thank you so much for coming. Any other elected officials I'm missing, please let me know. Shout out to everybody. So this year we had two goals for Women's Equality Day commemoration. First was to honor and recognize our bodies ourselves. We are so pleased that two of the founders who are also active today are here with us, Judy Narsegian and Norma Swenson. Thank you for coming. And second, to have our theme to focus on women's health and the maternal health crisis, women of color, which OBOS today is hard at work on, as is the governor, lieutenant governor administration, and uh, Mayor Wu's administration. And we will be hearing from, I'm very glad that they were able to join us today. I want to get this right. Dr. Robert Goldstein, Commissioner of the Department of Public Health for the state of Massachusetts. And also, Elaine Fitzgerald Lewis, who is with us here as well the Director of the Bureau for Family Health and Nutrition. Thank you so much. So, um, and also, and Alexandra Valdez, uh, we have a replacement for her today. So I want to thank Attorney General Andrea Campbell for her office's recent announcement awarding significant funds, I think it was 1.5 million, 1.5 million, to fund women's health centers to address these exact issues. And she's very sorry she could not join us today. Our bodies ourselves. A great way to start with the theme of women and girls' health is with Our Bodies Ourselves, a global organization that grew out of an early women's liberation conference here in Boston in 1969. Like many of you, I recall when they started in their books became both critical sources of information and now iconic. As these, year march, these years march on, it seems a wonderful time to both recognize their founders and their ongoing terrific work. I am so pleased to introduce two of the co-founders to address you, Judy Narsegian and Norma Swenson. Thank you.
Norma Swenson is joining me. Back in 1971, yeah, yeah. and actually in early 72, yeah, yeah. when we incorporated as the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, I was the youngest person signing the document, and Norma was the oldest. I was 23, and she was 39. Now I'm 75, and Norma is 91. Woo! a few introductory remarks by way of history, legacy, and then we're going to be followed by Laura Prieto, wave up your hand Laura, who is the program director at Our Bodies Ourselves Today, which is operated at Suffolk University, she'll say more about that, and also two amazing board members at Our Bodies Ourselves, Diana Namambeja Boye, who is chair of the board, in beautiful color, purple and white, and Chris Alonso, another board member who is an um, amazing expert in maternal and child health and who led the integration of midwifery for Mexico for, I think you were there 20 years, Chris, amazing. The second wave of the women's health movement in the U.S. had its origins in the late 1960s when women's groups, health and medical providers, and others organized a countrywide effort to legalize abortion. Many of these groups subsequently took up other health issues as well. Some established women-controlled health centers, some produced women's health publications, such as Our Bodies or Cells, and others carried out women's health advocacy projects, often with the goal of changing public policies affecting women's health. Originally called the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, which is still our legal name, we rebranded as Our Bodies or Cells in 2002 and continued our educational and advocacy work as part of a growing women's health movement both here in the U.S. and abroad. By the way, a copy of that very first newsprint edition of Our Bodies, Ourselves is over on the table for those of you who'd like to take a look. The early groups in this second women, a wave of the women's health movement were primarily white and middle class in their composition and orientation, although they sometimes addressed the concerns of poor women and women of color. During the 1980s, women of color created both local and national organizations to focus more intensively on their priority issues. They had already been organized to address so many other critical issues. You will hear today about a really important local project, the Neighborhood Birth Center, um, a freestanding, community-controlled birth center located in Nubian Square, Roxbury, that will provide McGriffey-led care and open its doors in 2025. Other groups were created by women with disabilities, older women and lesbians, all speaking to the many unmet needs of women and girls. Most of us who were our bodies ourselves co-founders had roots in the civil rights and anti-war movements. We in our bodies ourselves were primarily white and middle class, and only years later in the 80s and 90s began to address the very critical issue of white privilege. One of our important contributions during the 70s was the co-organizing of the 1975 Conference on Women and Health which was held not far from here on the campus of Harvard Medical School. And don't you think that Dean Dan tried to shut down the conference when he heard that 2,500 women were descending upon the medical campus from around the country? <laughs> the yes. The proceedings, a newsprint publication now available at our website, offers a comprehensive overview of the many issues and concerns that were a focus then and even now, from violence against women to the unnecessary medicalization of women's lives to the need for systemic health care reforms. For example, we were early advocates of single-payer health care, which was a primary focus of the Massachusetts Women's Health Care Coalition in 1994. Its six-page principles document is still an amazing piece. Our work back then is now emphasized the following, the importance of prevention, self-help approaches, critiques of institutional racism, classism, sexism, ageism, and so forth, importance of working in groups rather than as, as individuals in order to be more effective agents for change. The health of women and their families depended far more on other factors not just medical care, things like safe environments, clean air and water, adequate food and housing, better working environments, reducing violence against women, and most important of all, reducing poverty. And I'm so glad that we have representatives from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health where there is a public health emphasis on these issues. Starting in the mid-1990s, we also began emphasizing the importance of the reproductive justice framework, which was developed in 1994 by black women and other women of color. You'll hear more about this in a little bit. I also want to just briefly mention that we have been 
using our bodies or cells as a key means for educating women about health and sexuality from a feminist and consumer perspective. There are nine editions out there, the last one appearing in 2011. 11. And we believe it's the combination of uh, features where we had social and political analysis and many personal stories that convey the reality of women's lives that led the Library of Congress in 2012 to name Our Bodies Ourselves as one of 88 books that shaped America. Now this tradition is carried on at Suffolk University, the home of Our Bodies Ourselves today, and you will hear shortly from Laura Prieto about this remarkable website and resource for women and gender expansive people. Now I'm going to pass the mic on over to Norma, our oldest co-founder, to say a few more words. This is not my voice. <laughs> Sisters and brothers. Is that applause? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, um, I think I'm a little too close to the mic is my analysis. I'm going to try again. Before I say anything else, I want to tell you that I have been gripped in the last 24 to 48 hours by a story coming out of Brazil. Some of you may not know that there are now, in, not necessarily in print, but ever extant, some 34 different editions of our bodies ourselves in languages other than English. I want you to think about that. They didn't have any money. They didn't know how to do this as non-professionals, which most of them were, although they always consulted with professionals. It was to elevate women's voices in each and every one of those countries so that they could have something to say about their health and medical care. I feel tremendously privileged that this has happened and that I have been able to meet so many of the women and discuss so many of their concerns, not so different from ours in so many places in the world. What happened in Brazil, I think, should be a rallying cry against violence against women. A magnificent 74-year-old grandmother with her grandchildren was shot 17 times and died with her children locked in the closet. She was a powerful leader in her community. She was the leader of a religion. Let's say her name. Her name was Bernadette. Let's, and the, she was called in Brazilian, Portuguese, Mao Bernadette. Let's have a moment of silence for Mother Bernadette, who was killed so brutally. I've been privileged to work um, with representatives from all over Brazil on the Brazilian edition, which came out in its final form uh, this year and will perhaps encourage uh, Brasileiras and other people who are here in this country to meet together as they have in other countries and talk about producing their own uh, Our Bodies Ourselves for Brasileiras living away from home in Brazil. This is one of my hopes for that. As a consequence of that, I feel extremely close to that community, but it is a message because this woman was the leader of a religion. She was protecting the property that was owned by the indigenous people, and that is why she was killed. They had already killed one of her sons. She knew that she was a marked woman, and she continued to lead there's a message there, this is a political message, 
violence against women is one of the things that keeps us silent. Intimidation is real if your children are at risk. Violence is well known to communities of color, and I want to make the connection between this day, this celebration, and the maternal mortality crisis in Massachusetts. Because it is, among other things, about voting. Let's, let's illuminate that connection. Our legislature has voted against so many proposals year after year that would assist women in their communities. Right now, I've been told, as many women are saved on the delivery table as die. I am not impressed with this. Do you understand why? It is because we pour our resources into the tertiary care centers and we do nothing for the community. Conservatives in Washington, conservatives in Massachusetts, or people who think it's fashionable to vote that way, are the ones who vote down community programs. They vote down nutritional programs. Find out who you're voting for. We're women voters. Let's look and see if we can change that picture because there's no better illustration in medicine of what prevention is about than maternity care. If we start before she becomes pregnant, if we support her during her pregnancy, this is not rocket science. Not only is it not rocket science, but we have good studies that show from the American Association of Birthing Centers that women at risk can have better outcomes if they meet together in a supportive environment in groups with resources coming from the community. We can do this, but it won't come from an analysis that's based on hospital-based care. Thank you. All right. That's it. That's my policy program. invite Laura Prieto to come up and speak a little bit about Our Bodies Ourselves today. Good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks on behalf of Executive Director of Our Bodies Ourselves today, Amy Again, who couldn't be here today, as well as myself, um, to Suffolk, uh, excuse me, to um, Suffrage 100 Massachusetts for inviting us to co-host this Women's Equality Day celebration. Um, I'm really honored to be here with this program today, including the Opus founders who are speaking. Um, it is my second official day as... Um, just wanted you all to know that, um, but I'm happy to say a few words about how the legacy of Our Bodies Ourselves, the book, continues in a new form now in the website that we call Obos Today. Obos Today is a project of the Center for Women's Health and Human Rights at Suffolk University. So after nine editions of the book in the United States, there is this new manifestation of both the um, mission and the content of those books. We use a digital platform to advance the same founding mission of OBOS and the work of the global women's health movement to share health information broadly interpreted, as you were hearing, as, as um, Judy and Norma said, thinking about the whole person um, in terms of health. That's relevant to women, to girls, to gender expansive people. It's a curation of reliable, evidence-based information. I think that's a very precious commodity right now. Um, the highest quality currently available, it is vetted by experts that include activists as well as researchers and academics. It is openly accessible. This is also very important um, in the public interest, You know, not a commercial site, and curated for expertise, but also with that feminist perspective, which we feel is essential. Our resources encompass facts and stories, because as Obos established from the start, 
we are complete human beings and we are experts on our own lives and bodies and need to share those stories about ourselves to fully know our lives and our bodies. And we provide information not just to understand how things are, which we will be talking about some more today, but also information to help guide work towards the equity and justice that should be. As we're here to underline today, there is a long-standing and worsening crisis of maternal death rates and morbidity in Massachusetts and frankly across the United States. Um, and please note, I'm using maternal, which is very gendered language, um, but that is the language used in the statistics being collected that we have to rely upon. Mortality is rising for all birthing people and it is significantly worse for black women and women of color um, who experience three to four times higher death rates than white birthing people. And for every death connected to childbirth, there are many cases of severe morbidity. I'm talking about sepsis, strokes, heart attacks, and other unnecessary illnesses. We need to do something about that. It is not a new or a sudden crisis. And there are, of course, many factors at work that contribute to this systemic problem. It's not just an issue of medical care, as Norma was saying, but of racism, of violence, of poverty and stress. Obos and Obos today testified on this issue when Massachusetts investigated conditions in the state, releasing a report in July with policy recommendations. And at the Obos Today website, you can find more resources on what you can do as an individual, as a care provider, as an ally, and as an advocate. Um, for example, we have resources on the difference that black midwives can make to these outcomes. And there are some flyers available on the table along with other materials um, if you want a, a short piece to describe this website and where to find us, although we're not hard to find. We all need to work together towards change, especially around the significant racial inequities, so that birthing people of all identities can lead healthy lives before, during, and after labor and delivery. It is our hope that OBOS Today will help equip us and you to do that work. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over, I guess, to Diane. over in Longwood, a hospital right down the hill over there, and I could also get in an Uber and go a little farther south to the south end. A lot of choices. I'm classified as white. If I was black, that would also mean that I would have five times higher rate of probably having a hemorrhage, a stroke, a cardiac event, or coming out of the birthing event with hypertension. These aren't choices. It's not a choice when you have one choice. And what we're doing at OBOS right now is working on people of Massachusetts having choices when it comes to their bodies and themselves. So we're working on three things, and we're working on them very heavily, and we know that we're not alone in working on this because the way that we work on them is with other people, with other collectives, and with other groups that have been working on these issues. The first thing we're working on is opening birth centers. There is one freestanding birth center in Massachusetts. There are two doctored public health programs in Massachusetts and one free birth standing, free standing birth center. That makes absolutely no sense. So we've been working really hard to help open the neighborhood birth center. We've been doing a lot of fundraising, a lot of talking, a lot of testifying, but we're also concerned that one birth center in Roxbury is not enough. We need to reopen the birth center in Cambridge. We need to reopen the birth center in the North Shore. And frankly, we need a birth center in pretty much every single neighborhood. So we need to keep working on that. The other choice for birth is having your baby at home, which has been demonstrated to be safe. Cool. You can get a lot of high medical degrees. This is a problem. Because certified professional midwives have individuals to get children and start families does not impact the human, the fundamental human right of these surrogates. 
there are so many concerns coming up, including recruiting them because they are poor, forcing them to move away from their homes, to go through medical procedures that are not even their choices, and so many other things, including not adopting evidence-based practice. What have we done? We've collaborated with colleagues um, and started up a campaign to have legislatures in different states in the U.S., and to also in, start, we also started a website, Surrogacy 360, in 2016, that has commercial free information for all parties involved and highlights the impacts of these relationships to all parties involved. And I am all for access and equity and for people to parent, you know, reproductive justice to parent when and how they wish to do so. There is also a component of equity. Even as a clinician, I can't afford to go and pay someone to carry my child. How is that equitable to everyone else who is willing and wishing to have a family? So we are looking to put together a legislature that will, in fact, make this uh, free, I mean, safe, equitable, and, of course, allowing people to have the freedom they want to, um, to have children. I think that's that, and I think I'd like to mention that our colleagues, uh, the Center for Genetics and Society, we work with them closely, are now hosting the Surrogacy 360 website, and I continue to serve on their International Advisory Committee around this issue. And I am the board chair of our boss, and if you want, have any follow-up questions and like to reach about out about our work at, at uh, Suffolk with our boss today, Laura is here, I'm here, Chris, my colleague is here. We'll be delighted because the more we recruit allies, the more we achieve the goal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our bodies, ourselves. Can we have a round of applause for Judy, Norma, Laura, Diana, and Christina. Thank you so much. Say thank you to them. They have these bumper stickers. I love this. Our bodies, our votes. Dot org. <laughs> so those are on the table, I think, uh, for you to help yourselves. So um, I, it is my pleasure to introduce Mariangeli. Did I say that right? Mariangeli Solos. She's chief of chief of equity and inclusion, the mayor's office of women's advancement, or is that for the whole city? The city. Thank you for joining us. I've been sitting in the front row for quite some time. I'm a little hot, so tap into these in your wonderful toe bag. They're the most beautiful little fans that I've ever seen. I've, I've been using it, so thank you. Um, buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Maria Angeli Solis Rivera, Chief of Equity and Inclusion for Mayor Michelle Wu, and I am here on behalf of um, the Mayor's Office of Women's Advancement, which is in the Equity and Inclusion Cabinet. Um, I want to tell a little story about my journey with feminism and then I'm gonna end with the work that we are doing as a city to move the work forward. Um, I first had my, I had my first interaction with the struggle of womanhood when I was six years old and I was watching my mom iron strangers clothes in our living room and I was like mommy porque estás haciendo eso? Mommy why are you doing that? Because your dad doesn't let me work and we need additional cash to pay the bills. Um, then I had my first interaction with the concept of feminism in U.S. history class in the 11th grade when I first learned about 1919, women's right to vote, and eventually I was introduced to my favorite feminist of all time, Bell Hooks, who challenges us to think about the patriarchy as a system and how collectively we must charge at it rather than fighting one another because we together must move the work. And now, in this work of Chief of Equity as a lesbian, I am thinking about the future, and I want children. And my gosh, it is expensive. It is something that is really challenging for two women to, to think about. We are going to foster, we want to adopt, and in the event that we want to birth, we're looking at quite some money to have to invest in having children. And the reason I'm sort of walking you through this journey 
is because in this role of Chief of Equity and Inclusion, I now get to lead an incredible team of 70 plus people, people who use wheelchairs, women who use wheelchairs, women who are trans, women who are queer, women who are black, women who are white, women who are aging, women who are Gen Zers, and it has been a wonderful experience to see the power that we have together, and I have also witnessed how we do not move forward together if we're not building that collective power. And so, as a city, under the leadership of the first elected woman, mother, Asian American woman, Mayor Michelle Wu, I'll pause. Um, it has been an honor to to have the opportunity to ask those questions and push that work forward. And with the Women's Advancement Offices, it, office, sorry, in partnership with the Boston Public Health Commission, we have a series of programs and initiatives that we are focusing on. Black maternal health and investing some dollars in there to make sure that black women in the city of Boston, black parents in the city of Boston have the resource that they need to not only um, have children, but also be build homes that are safe and build communities alongside their city. One thing that we as a city think about often, it's, it is our responsibility to build safe communities. It is the responsibility of the housing department, it is the responsibility of the streets department, and so how do we all step in together and build that out? The other thing that we are working on that I want to shout out is um, our menstrual equity work. I know that earlier it was mentioned. Our goal is to ensure that every public library and every Boston public school has access, access to menstrual products. And we've already started a pilot where six of our public libraries have access to um, menstrual products in both men and women's bathroom because we, it's past the time that we accept that that's what we needed. And last but not least, we're doing all of these and more initiatives in all languages and for all people who identify as women. Thank you very much. I hope to learn way more from you all. Thank you. It's always great to meet new people doing this work. Mary Angela Solis, thank you so very much. We um, are sorry that Alexa Valdez could not join us, but thrilled that you were able to today. Thank you very much. Another round, please, for the City of Boston for all Um, and now it is my great honor to introduce two people who I apologize they're not in the program because we had gone to print, but we're so glad that they are here with us today. Uh, Dr. Robert Goldstein is the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and with him is Elaine, uh, Elaine Fitzgerald Lewis, who is the Bureau Director for Family Health and Nutrition for Massachusetts. Dr. Goldstein, thank you so much. So happy to be here with you on this incredibly beautiful day in this spectacular location uh, where even the giant swans behind us are reflecting the spirit of today's moment. Um, I was actually looking online at some of the photos of previous Women's Equality Day events and I have to admit uh, I was quite pleased to see that there have been a number of men who have been speakers over the years as well as many men who have participated in the events and the activities. That's because women's history is history. The suffrage journey is a critical piece of history in this country, for all of us. The 19th Amendment embodies the idea that women's voices and perspectives and their votes should and must be heard and counted to strengthen our nation. Those same principles are at work every day in public health. Everyone should count. Everyone should be heard. Everyone should have a voice. And everyone should have a right to the basic services that promote human health and ultimately strengthen our society. So I'm here to tell you, to commit to you, that women's experiences, concerns, ideas, and opinions are fully integrated into every decision-making process and in every policy that we adopt at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. I've been in the role of Commissioner of Public Health for a little more than four months, and during this time, I've been the messenger for some extremely difficult reports about the health and well-being of the Commonwealth. Last month, we reported that the prevalence of severe maternal morbidity in the state nearly doubled from 2011 to 2020. Even more sobering is that black, non-Hispanic birthing people consistently experience the highest rates of labor and delivery complications, 
a rate that's two and a half times higher than that of white, non-Hispanic burning people. That is unacceptable. We're engaged at the department in multiple actions to turn this situation around. We've established a statewide maternal health task force that's developing a plan for attacking this problem head on. We're working with hospitals and providers to implement a, maternity, a maternal equity bundle, which includes best practices to improve outcomes for people of color during pregnancy and delivery. We're invested in training more than 500 healthcare providers across the state on techniques to offer equitable and respectful care and to recognize and dismantle structural racism because it's racism, not race, that drives these inequities and worsens outcomes. Beyond our ongoing efforts to improve maternal health and labor and delivery outcomes, this past year has brought new challenges related to reproductive rights. Sadly, like tragically, last year, women in this country lost the fundamental right for reproductive freedom when the Supreme Court struck down the Roe v. Wade decision, sending abortion decisions back to the states. And today, there are 21 states that have passed either outright bans on abortion or have placed severe restrictions on the procedure. In the face of these national setbacks, Massachusetts stands firm in its commitment to protect a person's right to abortion. In fact, the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth strengthened its protections to both patients and providers in the wake of the Supreme Court decision. In April, just as I was joining the department, Governor Healy issued an executive order to protect medication-induced abortions in response to a federal court ruling in Texas. And the Healy Driscoll administration also took the important step of stockpiling mifepristone to make sure that the state had ample supplies of abortion medication for the future. This stockpile sits with the Department of Public Health and will remain available to those in need, despite the shifting legal landscape and any adversarial judicial rulings. Our fight, the department's fight, does not end with access to abortion. We're working to protect reproductive rights by taking a closer look at those organizations and facilities that provide inaccurate, misleading, and frankly dangerous information about reproductive care, pregnancy, and abortions. Such misrepresentation can be harmful physically, emotionally, and psychologically to the individuals who may be unsure of their options and are seeking help and support at a vulnerable time. Dishonest, deceitful, and deceptive practices have no place in healthcare, in abortion care, or in the Commonwealth. And before I turn the podium over to Elaine Fitzgerald Lewis, my colleague at DPH, I want to thank Suffrage 100 Massachusetts for your devotion to keeping alive the stories about the bold and courageous women who are resolute in their mission to gain the right to vote, to challenge the status quo, and to fight hard for what's right. The stories you share highlight the power of collective actions of women that have transcended the boundaries of race, class, age, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, and gender. And this day is all about remarkable women, so I'm honored to introduce you to one of them. Elaine Fitzgerald Lewis is the director of the department's Bureau of Family Health and Nutrition, and like so many of you, she's a passionate and devoted advocate and champion for women and children in the Commonwealth. Please come up, Elaine. Thank you, Commissioner Goldstein. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor to be here today with all of you, including my daughter, who's been running around, um, who just the other night was actually reading to me her book on Susan B. Anthony and talking about the suffragette movement. So to think not even a week later, I'd be standing here celebrating with all of you Women's Equality Day, a memory I will cherish, like the one that I have holding her as an infant, not too far from here, um, during the Women's March in 2017. So thank you for today and the opportunity to share a little bit about our work at the Department of Public Health in support of women's health. My ability to fill the role as director for the Bureau of Family Health and Nutrition is rooted in my life experiences as a first generation immigrant, a veteran with a service disability, as a sexual assault survivor, a maternal and child health advocate, and now as a mother. I have a pro profound appreciation and the personal experience fighting for equality and challenging the status quo. Now with DPH, I have the privilege to lead others, both within the system and outside, to lift their voices 
and collectively work together towards a shared goal of dismantling structural racism and co-creating healing-centered systems, programs, and policies that will support women, children, youth, and families to enjoy their optimal health. Sadly, we know that our system is not perfect and recognize that it is in fact broken for far too many. And that is why women's voices are so important and I would say essential for making effective, sustainable systems level change. Our work now goes beyond equality. We are fighting for equity and eliminating disparities in maternal health. We are fighting to ensure women have access to quality health care across her lifespan regardless of the color of her skin, sexual orientation, zip code, age, or immigration status. Our efforts in public health to eliminate barriers and burdens on women are grounded in data. Data that tells us how health outcomes are influenced by factors such as race, ethnicity, language, employment, disability, and education. Data helps us to think about how and where to expand programs like home visiting helps us to understand where gaps are in services, such as reproductive care, breastfeeding, postpartum depression screening and treatment, and where to target outreach and information, like access to free contraception, benefits like paid family leave, and nutritional foods for you and your family. But data can only take us so far. Your voice drives change as members of our Maternal Health Task Force, our Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant Advisory Committee, through our WIC Advisory Council, or our Doula Partner Advisory Group, just to name a few. The experiences you share in surveys like the COVID Com Community Impact Survey and the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Survey inform where are the greatest needs and how to prioritize resources. Your voices tell us what is working and how we can do better. As youth seeking care through your health school programs or as family members participating in hospital-based quality improvement projects, your voice matters. Women's voices matters in making effective, sustainable systems level changes that will benefit not only women, but their children, families, and our communities. Because women are the heart of every community. So in wrapping, please consider this. I know all of you are strong advocates and to those out there joining us, consider sharing your voice, your time, your story, your passion, wherever you can with legislators and providers as members of one of our many advisory groups or councils completing surveys and assessments, all of which are valuable ways to inform and change the system. And my hope is that you can see us at DPH as partners, allies, and co-conspirators fighting to build a better system so that women like you and our daughters can enjoy long, healthy lives. Thank you. Oh my gosh, music to our ears. Thank you so very much. I have a couple of things to just close with, but while I'm doing that, I'm gonna ask that all speakers get ready. We're gonna to gather together to get a joint picture of all the speakers. And following that, we want a picture of everybody here today for our annual photo that's on the cover of the uh, program that you have today. So as I'm talking, just be ready that we're gonna to try to get a quick photo so we don't lose a couple of our speakers. I want to give a shout out to some of our partners. Uh, as you may know, some of you may know, Suffrage 100 MA has over 200 partner organizations. They're on our website. And in addition to the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts, the League of Women Voters of Needham I know is here, and there may be others. And also the Greater Boston section of the National Council of Negro Women with my friends Linda and Dale. Thank you so much, Anita, for coming today. Very much appreciated. Um, I also want to, I can't read my own notes, that's a problem. Oh, Mass Now. Mass Now is here. Thank you, Mass Now. Are there other partner organizations that I missed? Oh, yeah, uh, Mass Women's Political Caucus. Yay, thank you so much. Freddie, <laughs> Freddie. Um, um, I actually, 
Say it louder. Um, I actually it's a uh, stage hand. Here, you get to come and ask. <laughs> Sorry. I actually uh, we are stage hand and production like we work in like, theaters and. Um, I also want to welcome Suffolk University, who is here today, I know, because of their connection with Obos, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, the last thing I'll say, I don't know, Lynn, did, was Lynn Paget able to come? I don't see her. Lynn Paget, uh, please look her up. The Swan Boats, 2011, Mayor Menino, may he rest in peace, wanted to honor the Swan Boats. We wanted to do Women's Equality Day with the mayor's office, and that was our first year, and I'm so thankful that they agreed then and every year since the swan boats have, as the commissioner noted, wearing their votes for women's sashes, and uh, which is so wonderful. Every year for this event, they do that for us. Lynn Padgett, who is a healthcare professional, also is a family member, and I'll end on this feminist note because you never know. Uh, Robert Padgett started the Swan Boats in the 1870s. He got a, um, a license to uh, launch his boat. He did it for one year and he passed away suddenly. He was in his 40s. He had a wife with four children who is now a widow and no way to raise her family. She took over the Swan Boats, but in the 1870s, 1880s, it was not popular for women to run companies. So they made her jump through hoops and get signatures. She persevered for 30 years. And her family runs it today, including Lynn Padgett and her cousin, Phil. So kudos and thank you to the Padgett family. And with that, I will say thank you so much to each of you for coming. Uh, as um, I think it was Tina Cassidy said, keeping the suffragists alive and all that they did, not just for voting, but for women in general, as the commissioner talked about the equality of our society. Thank you for coming, and please stick around for photos. Thank you.